I hope everybody kept their power. I did not, but um, but I hope everybody, most everybody else did and has your, obviously you're on Zoom, so you have your connection. Um, next month, we're going to do it. We're going to do the hybrid. We will be in person at the Washtenaw County Learning Resource Center, 95% um, likely. So uh, keep, an, keep an eye out for that. It, we really are looking forward to getting back together and being able to have side conversations without being obnoxious and just, you know, really, really getting to see each other in meaningful ways. So one more month, purely, um, purely Zoom. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to open the meeting with a land acknowledgement. Uh, Washtenaw County occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of an Anishinaabek of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Adawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi. And the Washtenaw County Democratic Party recognizes historic indigenous communities in Michigan and those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. Washtenaw County occupies land ceded in the 1807 Treaty of Detroit. We further recognize the ongoing relationship of dependence upon and respect for all living beings of earth, sky, and water. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. Thank you to the Anishinaabe Caucus and its founder, Andrea Pierce, for that land acknowledgement. Um, I'm just going to do a quick update on our on organization business. Um, the board is involved in a very impressive strategic planning process. We have Michelle Pallas. Um, some, some of you know Michelle. She has spent her life uh, work in organizational change management. She donated her time to work with us very closely uh, over 10 hours in person <laughs> and lots of time behind the scenes to help us get really clear about vision, mission, and our goals which we are, all of the committees are working on goals and objectives and timelines and budget and so forth. So I'm very, very, very happy um, that we're able to do this and I'm very thankful to committee members, um, not just count, I'm sorry, I have county committee written down here, but I mean the standing committee leaders who are the executive board members of the WCDP for working so hard on this um, really, really important effort because we take our work super seriously. Um, so actually, I would like for um, all of the executive board members, can you just put your hand up on screen? You know how to do that, like down at the bottom. Um, somebody can say how to do that. Put your hand up. Put your hand up. Thank you, Rosanita. Mary. Who else? Caroline. WCDP POC. I think that's, I think that's a Janet. Tom Knox. Kathy Wyatt. Thank you all. I mean, it's just incredible work that you're doing. Um, so that's great. And then how about if we have hands up from electeds who are here? A lot of you are gonna be speaking, but not all of you. Sharon Simon, and I miss Joe, thank you. <laughs> all right, great. Great to see everybody. And, um, and now um, how about precinct delegates? All you precinct delegates. Hi, it's good to see you doing the, Yeoman's work, <laughs> fantastic. Hey, JD, it's good to see you. You've been a PD for probably the longest person here, I think. JD has, yeah. Um, I'm probably missing a group. Oh, yes, I actually want to know who's new. If you have never attended a WCDP uh, meeting before, would you raise your hand? Anybody? We have a whole, Sharon Simonton is the new co-chair for membership, and we have a very happy meeting um, or meeting plan coming up. Horst, thank you for joining us. Caroline, your hand's still up, and I know you, we know you really well, county committee member and um, executive board member. Horst Schmidt, we welcome you. We're glad you're here, and we hope to see you in person next month. It will happen. So um, if all of you who've been attending these meetings for some time, um, know that this is a little bit of a different format. We wanted, and that was part of the strategic planning process, we were thinking, you know, we really want to spend more time with our elected leaders, talking with them about what they're doing in Lansing, getting, you know, getting, and Lansing and here in, um, um, in the county, and getting more information about what they're doing, letting them hear from us, hearing them talk to each other, and so forth. So we have an hour with our elected leaders 
um, from Debbie Dingle on to uh, county commission, uh, county commissioners. So we have, I think I'm a little early. Oh my God, isn't that great? Okay, so we can have a little more time with our county, uh, with our leaders, elected leaders. And um, what we decided to do was to have uh, the elected leaders speak about their work and then we'll have Q&A at the same time. So if you have a question for the elected leader who's speaking, um, raise your hand and we'll unmute you and you can ask it. We have, uh, we're gonna start with Carrie Reingans. Hey, Carrie, who's um, a representative, a state representative who was one of the sponsors of new legislation for Michigan to join the National Popular Vote Initiative. So Carrie, wanna take it away? Sure, thank you so much, Chair. Um, Chair Reed. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to be here this morning and super grateful that I still have both electricity and internet um, in my house, which I did not last last week. So um, I can join you here today. And uh, I'm happy to be talking about legislation that I introduced this week with Senator Chang. We introduced identical bills to uh, allow Michigan to join the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. So like any interstate compact, this is our state legislature and governor signing a law that it will allow our state to join some compact. And we, you know, these, these happen from time to time. So this one would use the power of the United States constitution that it gives us as a state legislature to determine how we award our electoral college votes. And right now, the way we do it is the presidential candidate that wins the most votes in Michigan will get all of our electoral college votes. And in the, uh, in the interstate compact, what we would do is change the way we award our electoral college votes to be matching what the national popular vote is. And this only goes into effect once enough states join that 270 electoral college votes are committed to this interstate compact and committed to the national popular vote winner. So that would make um, the person who wins the most votes across the entire country, the same person who wins the electoral college votes and therefore um, would be elected president. So uh, the reason I'm interested in this, I've, I've actually followed the issue for a little while now, a uh, couple of years. And my very first uh, presidential election was in 2000, the very first one I could vote for. And I was a, a college uh, <laughs> freshman and I oh, had only been in college for a couple months. I was high school class of 2000, the class of the millennium. But um, so I had only been in college a couple months when I cast my vote. I had to drive home back in those days because I couldn't vote absentee if I was, you know, physically able to be uh, in my jurisdiction where I was still registered to vote at home in Linden, Michigan. So I drove home, voted, and then was so excited uh, to see who won the presidential election. And even back then I was a Democrat. So I uh, was very excited for President Gore. And then I saw that President Gore won the most votes across the country. And then I was pissed as hell that the Supreme Court awarded the presidency to um, the loser of the popular vote. George W. Bush. And then I became increasingly more pissed over the years watching what the, the loser of the popular vote did to our country, uh, including creating a whole entire new National Department of Homeland Security. So um, that was my introduction really to politics, uh, besides um, having done some local work in my community. So ever since then, I've been just like mad at the unfairness of the person who comes in second being able to win the presidency. So uh, I did actually campaign on this a little bit by putting this on some of my campaign literature and websites that I wanted to see us join the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. So when I um, started uh, looking at bills I could introduce this term, I had seen my colleague Rep Colazar had introduced this in the past uh, term on the House side, and I approached him and he said he had like a lot of other priorities to deal with this term. So um, I was very happy that he would let me um, pick up that bill and be able to introduce it this term. Um, we've been working with the national group called National Popular Vote, and it's a bipartisan group. This has always been a bipartisan movement, and 
There's only a small uh, couple groups that are opposing this. Most democracy groups support it. We had a press conference this week with um, voters, not politician, uh, not politicians. League of Women Voters has been in support of this for a long time. Um, Common Cause Michigan, Mothering Justice, and um, the ACLU of Michigan were with us at that press conference. Uh, we also have a letter from uh, with a long list of over a dozen prominent Republicans, um, former speakers of the House and Senate leaders and Republican party chairs. So this is a bipartisan issue. So we introduced the bill on Wednesday and it was referred to the elections committee and we'll be having hearings pretty soon here. And um, the secretary of state is supportive, the governor is supportive. So uh, this could be the term where this happens. Uh, and then we wouldn't probably have enough states joining the compact by 2024 for this to go into effect in 2024. So it would probably go into effect if we can get a couple more states by 2028 presidential election. And honestly, I had to win the most popular votes in my district to be a person representing my district. I think the president should have to do the same in their district and their district is the entire country. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that folks have. If, I don't know if, if you wanna do it in the chat, um, or we can do it in chat, or if you want to raise your hand, we'll um, uh, Eli will uh, unmute you. And while we're waiting, I'm going to ask um, myself. I'm not going to ask myself. I'm myself going to ask Gary. How many more states do we need? We need. To, can you explain like how how it's going to work? Sure. So right now there are 15 states plus Washington, D.C. So Washington, D.C.'s votes do get counted in the Electoral College. So 15 states plus D.C. And we have a total of 195 Electoral College votes committed. Michigan has 15. So if we join, we would be at 205. Minnesota is also hearing, doing hearings right now um, in their state legislature in the Senate and the House. And so if they join with their 10, we could be at 215 um, by the end of this calendar year, possibly. So then we'd only need a few more states to join in order for us to um, reach the 270 threshold. Okay, and how exciting. Ian, Eli, thanks for, um, thanks for unmuting Lisa. Lisa, do you wanna, you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, I'm with Voters Not Politicians in Washtenaw County. And okay. I'm wondering if we do pass this in Michigan, this year, is it something that the Republicans could simply undo if they regained power in the legislature in the near future? Yes, so since it's a state law, it can be uh, repealed as a state law with a future legislature. The uh, state of Michigan cannot exit the compact within six months of a presidential election. So if there were to be a movement to repeal, it wouldn't be possible for that repeal to happen within six months of a presidential election. So there are prohibitions within the law itself uh, about when it can be repealed or when when we can exit the com interstate compact. So if we pass this and enough states pass it, and then by 2028, within six months of the, um, of the president being inaugurated is how the compact is um, described, which is January 20th. So that would be January 20th, 2029. Uh, we cannot exit the compact within six months of that date. Okay. Even if, even if it's repealed during that time, we wouldn't be able to exit the compact within six months of that date. That's so, just, go ahead, Lisa. Oh, and the, the only other one I was asking you is, um, is there, um, a projection of when this could possibly happen in America where you could get to the required number that you need? Our goal is to have this happen by the 2028 presidential election. We still need a few more states and every state that joins uh, is going to get more and more push, pushback by some of the, op there's only a couple opposition groups here in Michigan. There's um, Mackinac Center um, is an opposition group and um, there's a group called Save Our States that is uh, opposed to pretty much only national popular vote. That's the only thing they are opposed to. Um, but recently they started um, complaining about ranked choice voting as well. Mm. So there's only two real opposition groups. 
So I see that Horst Schmidt has his hand up. Um, perhaps one more question before the next speaker. Um, Mr. Schmidt. Yes, thank you. Um, I was, when I read reports, I noticed that uh, the, normally there are about 20 states that are considered liberal. Um, and I'm as, from, from, from what I've seen on maps, it's, it tends to be along the coasts and, um, you know, one or two in, inland states. But would, um, would 20, I'm assuming 20 states would be enough to get uh, past a 170 volt um, uh, needed to, to make the uh, uh, thing work. Um, so if we if we get these states in, uh, would uh, we have enough there? What, even if Michigan were to withdraw to keep the compact intact and and keep voting, uh, being being able to get the popular vote to work in in the other states and get a president elected that's voted in by the people, is that, is that clear? Or do I need to explain a little more? Can you just? Repeat the question part of your comment. Pardon me? Can you repeat the question part of your comment? Well, the que question is, if um, if Michigan were to withdraw from the uh, uh, compact, would, uh, would there be enough uh, states to having enough electoral votes so that we could uh, get a, a president elected by the popular vote? And assuming it's, you know, it's the basically the 20 states that are um, a little bit more liberal than, than uh, the other other part of the, of the country. Okay, um, so this is a nonpartisan topic uh, or bipartisan, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, so we don't need only liberal states and we don't want only liberal states to be joining this compact. Right now, we don't have enough states with electoral votes committed. So uh, if Michigan joins and then removes itself from the compact, uh, then we, we don't have enough states. If you're talking about in the future, by the time we have enough states that join this compact and then Michigan withdraws, it really depends on where we are over that 270. So we'll just have to stay tuned and see what happens across the rest of the country in order to see um, the impact of Michigan withdrawing, which I hope we would not do once we join this um, interstate compact. Thank you very, very much. Um, if, if there are no more questions, I'm going to move on to our next um, pair of, of electeds. Carrie, thank you so much for sponsoring this and for coming and telling us about it. I think it's incredibly exciting. I have huge hopes for this. I hope you're right, 2028. You are. I hope so too. Yes. That'd be so cool. So thank you. So this week and actually pretty much every week, we're always, we're traumatized by gun violence in this country. It's exploded, as we know, um, and uh, in the last several, in the last couple decades, and we have more guns in this country than we have people, as I think everybody knows. Um, Jason Morgan, our uh, representative, Jason Morgan, and Sue Shink, Senator Sue Shink. Sue, are you here? I don't see your name or face. I hope you're here. Um, are here to talk with us about. Um, what we're doing in Lansing about now that we have, thank God, a Democratic majority, what are we doing in Lansing um, and after the MSU tra tragedy? Uh, what are we doing in Lansing to, to get control of guns? Teresa, you ready? Do you want me to just jump in? Yeah, I don't see Sue. I, so I suspect perhaps she's at Dexter Forum with Congresswoman Dinkle. Oh, maybe. that's probably right. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I, I had heard that Sue couldn't get out of her driveway too. So it's possible she's uh, okay. on the internet. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, another Jeff, if you want to jump in, Jeff Irwin, if you want to jump in as well, that's fine too, to hold up the Senate end. <laughs> Good thing we have two senators and uh, like I think we have two senators. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, Jason. Um, well, here I'll. Uh, I'm happy to, to jump in. And start, you know, if Sue uh, joins. I mean, a lot of this is moving uh, in partnership. Uh, the exciting part of the uh, Democratic majorities that you all helped us get uh, is that we are all working together uh, in the House, the Senate, and the Governor's office toward um, doing good things and making sure that we are actually being responsive and taking action when um, the public and 
and all of you demand that we do it. Uh, since last week's, um, since the unfortunate shooting, uh, we've all been hearing from parents, teachers, schools, uh, community partners, uh, and the resounding response has been that we need immediate action. Um, that's been crystal clear. And the, um, actually, excuse me one moment, my cat is very aggressively trying to get into the room and um, banging on the door until he uh, is allowed <laughs> in. <laughs> um, can't lock him out and, uh, and then he uh, has lots of thoughts once he gets in here. Oh, geez. Um, so, uh, so it's been crystal clear. We, people are, are tired of thoughts and prayers. They expect immediate action. And um, frankly, it's, it's very exciting that we, we get to take immediate action and be in this place to do this work. Uh, so we are answering their call uh, by putting putting forward gun violence a gun violence prevention package, and we're determined to make sure that those bills uh, make their way to the governor's desk. They're making uh, significant progress here, going through the um, House Judiciary Committee this week, uh, and I believe they will come to us very soon um, for a, a final vote. Um, and there are a few pieces of that package that are important to to note. Um, there are three main priorities. One, establishing safe storage mandates requiring gun owners to secure their firearms safely and responsibly. Two, allowing the courts to issue extreme risk protection orders to take temporary possession of a firearm if an individual is a risk to themselves or others. Um, and uh, then the third is establishing background checks for all firearm purchases. Uh, these are very common sense gun, gun reforms. Uh, I think not just in our minds, but uh, through most Michiganders. Two thirds of Michigan voters support enacting uh, stricter gun laws in, um, uh, according to a poll in 2022 by Epic MRA. Uh, 90, over 90% 90 of Michigan voters support background checks. 74% uh, support uh, emergency risk protection orders or red flag laws that we commonly refer to them all, all as. Um, and even 67% of Republican primary voters support red flag laws. And then 63% uh, support safe storage. So the, the key to this is making sure that we're all moving together as Democrats. And I, I believe we have a lot of agreement on this, which is phenomenal. And it um, almost feels strange uh, with how quickly we all were on the same page. Um, and I say that because historically, I think you've had a party that has sometimes been divided when it comes to guns and abortion and other uh, critical issues uh, or gay rights even, uh, which we're also moving on um, soon here. Um, and, and that has not been the case this time, which has been the exciting part for me is that this that hasn't been the case. We've all been um, there was actually one moment, uh, Rep. Rangans, I think yesterday we were saying there was never even a conversation around, are we all on board with, uh, I forget which package. And uh, in some ways, like, yeah, we would like to have more conversations, but in other ways, it's it's great. We're all there. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I'm, I, there's certainly lots more I can share, but those are kind of the larger package of, of bills around gun, gun reform that we're moving. Uh, and then I have my uh, uh, We Can End Gun Violence t-shirt on. Uh, it's very, I mean, I, frankly, it's just so exciting to have protested and and been fighting and pushing for these things for so many years. How many protests have we gone to to say we have to do something meaningful to end gun violence and to be in one of these positions to help make it happen is a just a whole whole body warm experience to like be part of that. So I'll, I'll pass things over to uh, Senator Schenck and uh, thanks so much. Hi, I just hopped on because um, <clears throat> on our farm, we had about a lot of extra work this morning and we also have eight community high school seniors who spent the night and that is a pretty exciting thing. So um, <laughs> I appreciate what you said, Representative Morgan. I sat through three hours of heart-wrenching testimony on um, Thursday. I, you know, the, the, the people I'd read about in the news who had experienced extreme gun violence came and told us with their own words. 
And um, honestly, I don't know how anybody could have sat through that, listened to those stories and not say, yeah, these three very uh, non-invasive, non-burdensome laws will save so many lives. And we heard stories of, um, you know, how red flag laws would have saved lives, how background checks could have saved lives and how safe storage could have saved lives. And um, yet, yet there was still um, a Republican member of the committee who, who thought it appropriate to, to argue with Dana Nessel, even about the person who had just been arrested for threatening her and ev like every single Jewish elected official's life. And it was only because he put his threats online that they could arrest him. They had known about this for weeks. So we've had officials who have been working under the under a death threat for weeks with law enforcement unable to adequately mm -hmm. protect them, even though there was a direct threat. It wasn't until it went online that they could do anything. So I think, you know, and, and I, I bring this up because um, some people have said, well, can we bring the Republicans over? Um, you know, like if they're not here now, this is why we worked so hard to get a majority. I think um, some some of the things that people should know, though, is that the bills aren't finished. Um, there's been a lot of work in terms of having put in a bill and then hearing stakeholders feedback. So uh, the Michigan Sheriff's Association, I anticipate, will support all three of the bills. They put in some feedback about how to safely um, make that handover of the gun in the red flag law situation. Uh, just so you know, also, they have also asked us to pass a law banning open carry in sheriff's offices. Um, there are some sportsmen's groups who are saying that it will prevent children from learning target practice from a coach. That's not true. The final bill is going to address that. So really, in the end, if, if you get into conversations with, with friends or family members who are worried about these things, any law-abiding, mentally healthy person, I, I, and I want to also, we can talk about the mental health thing in a second. Any law-abiding person who is not at risk for gun violence will not be significantly affected by this. And in terms of the safe storage, there are lots of crazy arguments about why that's a bad idea. The bills will really um, address mostly safe storage in homes of minors, and um, there is no safe loaded accessible gun in 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 the vicinity of a minor. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't again prevent target practice. It doesn't prevent sharing your gun with someone when you're shooting. It, it's and it's not going to affect people who already own long guns. It's going to affect future purchases in terms of the background check. In terms of mental health, that's being left in there because there is a whole spectrum of mental health issues. This isn't to say that if somebody has a bad day or seeks the help of a psychiatrist or psychologist or social worker that they're going to lose their gun. It's if they're at risk of this kind of gun violence that kills people. So um, I will, uh, I'm, we can answer any questions. I just want people to know the bills aren't completely finished. There will be three more hours of testimony at the Senate next Thursday from 12 to three, if people are interested. Um, there, there were, I believe, three rooms packed. Not everybody could fit in. You can watch it on Senate TV. I don't have the link handy, but we could get it um, to Teresa. And there's a house TV as well, if people want to watch. It, it's hard to hear though. I'll just say that it's really hard to hear. Thank you. Great, thank you. Do you do you two want to speak also? And everybody, get your questions ready, okay? Get your hands up or or put questions in chat. Do you want to speak also to the um, the bill about um, banning guns in the Michigan legislature in the in the Capitol? I mean, is that part of this set of bills? Or I've been reading about that. It. I think that was the Capitol Commission. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So before they were prevented from, uh, you know, now now we have because we have the Democratic majority, there are going to be a lot of safety measures put in place at the Capitol, and that's the Capitol Commission that is okay. doing that. There may be a bill, but I don't believe one has been introduced yet. Um, sometimes things are very different in House than they are in the Senate. So Representative Morgan might know something I don't. Uh, no, that checks out with what I'm aware of. Uh, the the um, 
I think it's okay to say this now. Uh, we are certainly going to change some rules at the Capitol to allow signs and not allow guns, as <laughs> logic would tell you would be the case. Right? Like, you know, <laughs> right? it just is the dumbest thing in the world. Uh, but obviously, I know I've heard <laughs> from our leadership of the House that uh, the clear and obvious rules uh, will change uh, sometime very soon here where we can say, uh, no, leave your gun out of this building, um, but sure, bring your sign if you should choose to. That's great. Prioritizing the First Amendment, <laughs> <laughs> which arguably might be one of the more important ones since it was first. Actually, see, the number doesn't have anything to do with it, but still. <laughs> I see Marla has a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, thanks for muting, Eli. Okay, so. What kind um, of businesses are you looking for? Sorry, my watch is talking. Um, <laughs> I'm concerned about the bills with enforcement. Um, I'm very excited that we're doing this, but I, you know, and to be candid, obviously I am working with MAJ, Michigan Association for Justice. I'm one of the co-chairs for legislation, but. We have a lot of counties where when you pass these laws, we're concerned that they won't be enforced. Um, and we're wondering about civil liability so that we can help. Because oftentimes, mm. if there is that threat of civil suit, prosecutors will step in finally because they'd rather you know, do it that way than have people sued civilly. Um, is there any movement on that to make sure that people who are in more red counties can also get enforcement of these laws so that we can protect them? I don't know of any, I don't know of that kind of a, a provision going in there at this point. Um, I'm not directly negotiating these, I'm not negotiating these bills um, that there's another group of senators who are and, and representatives. Um, the Michigan Sheriff's Association is, is going to ultimately support these bills, which doesn't mean that every sheriff will, but it does mean that there's got to be a broad level of support of them. Um, and then the other thing is the Attorney General said very clearly that if these laws aren't enforced by local officials, she will. And I believe that there's support to make sure that she has the resources to do that. She's very serious about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think one of the things to remember about a lot of these bills, and I know that there's some of those sheriffs who, who just aren't going to do it because they're not going to do it. They do help make law enforcement's job easier. When the county officials were worried that somebody might come shoot us, the sheriff's office had very little in, the term, in, in terms of tools that they could use to keep us safe and to keep the potential uh, shooters safe. And um, it, they, they were in more danger because there was no red flag law because quite a few of them worked on this to make sure that we stayed safe. So I think the sheriffs, the sheriffs at least, recognize that this, this is about their safety as well as, as just regular people's safety as well. But I, I'll ask about that, Marla. I, I just, I don't think that it has been a piece of it. Thank Marla, you. Yeah, I, I guess I would simply add, um, that is a good question. I know the, um, initially when we were start the conversations were starting on these bills, that was the central question. Uh, and I know the, um, our colleagues who were kind of negotiating these things and tweaking the language uh, were trying to get at that, that central concern. Um, so I don't know if they were able to fully work that out, but, um, you know, please, uh, follow up with us after, and we can double check that to see, um, what we were able to sort out in that area. I think what Senator Schenk said, um, is, is likely the, the outcome that I'm aware of, um, with the attorney general, um, having kind of a backup opportunity to enforce, but we may not always have a democratic attorney general. So, um, that's definitely something we need to make sure we take care of. Thank you. And that's, a, I was going to say that, that I always worry that, um, oops, am I? Yes. That, um, you know, I love Dana. She is very dedicated here, but who's next after her? So, um, and I also want to thank Senator Schink for mentioning um, about the attack on the Jewish politicians. I'm also now interim 
chair of the Michigan Democratic Jewish Caucus. And it's been surprising how deafening the silence has been that there has not been many con um, comments about this, especially since there was a national day of hate against Jews on Saturday, last mm -hmm. Saturday, and we were all told to be worried about violence. So I really appreciate you mentioning that, Senator Schenck. Thank you. Thank you, Marla, for your um, for your questions and conversation, and, and both of you, Sue and Jason, thank you for your work. We have several questions left, but we're out of time right now, so I, I think I'd like to move on to our next um, legislators, and then if we have time at the end for more questions, let, we'll bring them in then, or you can always put uh, your questions in chat for uh, the people that you, you have them for, like you can put them directly to them or um, or in chat for everybody, and we will um, we will be able to distribute the chat. Um, okay, so our next um, our next uh, legislator to speak with us, as you guys know, the topic for today's meeting is um, uh, housing and homelessness crisis in Washtenaw County. It's a little bit hard to believe that we have a housing and homelessness crisis in Washtenaw County when it's such a wealthy county, but we do. Um, so we've invited Jeff Irwin, Senator Jeff Irwin, who is chair of the Senate's Housing and Human Services Commission, to talk with us um, before the main bulk of the program about what the Senate's doing in housing and homelessness. Thank you, Teresa, and good morning, Washtenaw Democrats. Hi, I'm Jeff Irwin, your state senator. It's an honor to serve. I am coming to you from my Zoom bunker and fortunate to have power. I just want to remind you all that um, you know, we are also here to serve, particularly if you know of folks who are vulnerable people, particularly maybe seniors, uh, folks who are poor, who are trapped without power, uh, please let us know their addresses so we can try to escalate their cases with the utilities. We need to really focus on making sure that those folks get turned back on as quickly as possible. Um, you know, there's still some folks in our community who are really uh, struggling with that. I also want to say that, um, you know, thank you to Washington Democrats and Democrats all over the state for giving us this majority. Not only now do we have an opportunity to uh, talk about issues like gun safety, uh, this week in the Senate, we passed an expansion of the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, which is going to protect our LGBTQ residents from discrimination in housing and uh, public accommodation and employment. Nobody should get fired for who they love or because of their gender identity. And it's because of the work that Democrats like all of you did that we are in a position to be able to uh, have these conversations and move some of these important policies forward. Now, I also just want to say on gun safety that I think there are a lot of great people who are out there talking about how this is a nonpartisan issue. And when you look at the polling, it's a nonpartisan issue. Uh, but I think that part of our jobs as Democrats is to say proudly that the reason why <clears throat> there is action on gun safety now isn't because the MSU crisis was closer to Lansing or that was somehow, you know, hit differently than the Oxford crisis. It's because Democrats are in control of the legislature. With Republicans in control of the legislature, we were going to do nothing in the wake of these tragedies. Now, with Democrats in control, we're in a position to do something, and hopefully these bills represent the starting point. All right, so I was invited to talk about uh, housing and human services. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what our committee is going to be doing in the coming months, but I also just wanted to focus a little bit uh, first on, on homelessness, because a lot of the work that we're doing in Lansing to address both housing and homelessness isn't really of a policy nature, it's more of a budget nature. And I want you to know that there is a housing plan that many of us are working on in Lansing to build more affordable units all over our state and to make sure that uh, the systems are set up in place to make sure that we can build more public housing and build more housing in the places where we need it most, where often it's actually most expensive to build that housing. We need to build affordable housing near opportunity, near work, near doctor's offices, near the sorts of amenities that people want and need. Uh, so number one item is build more affordable housing. To that end, uh, last year, we put a couple hundred million into workforce housing out of the Biden bucks. Uh, this year, we, are, we have already, already in just the first uh, six weeks, allocated another $150 million to affordable housing. Uh, and set up a future allocation, we've directed $50 million a year from the corporate income tax into perpetuity to go into the Housing and Community Development Fund at MISHTA. This is the first time, uh, in, in, uh, in my knowledge, that the state of Michigan has provided sustainable long-term funding 
to affordable housing that is flexible. These aren't federal funds. These are these are Michigan dollars going directly into one of the most important uh, human and economic development needs that we have here in our state. And so we've directed those dollars into the future, 50 million a year. Not enough, but that's a, a really important new uh, funding source we have. Um, we uh, are also uh, focused on uh, trying to make sure that we increase the reimbur or the uh, the rate that homeless shelters get uh, for housing homeless individuals. The rate that Michigan homeless shelters get for housing homeless individuals is far lower than the Great Lakes average. It hasn't yeah. moved in many years and mm -hmm. it's absolutely crushing our homeless shelters. Uh, they, they, they thrive uh, on, on private donations. The ones who are still surviving are usually doing so because of that. The state needs to step up more and provide the sort of resources necessary to keep these shelters and these emergency resources open open and available in our communities. Uh, we're also working on some other uh, appropriations elements. Uh, last year, I was able to secure $6 million for permanent supportive housing. Uh, that grant application just went out uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I think it's important that uh, our local providers and providers around the state plug into that, take advantage of it. And then that way, uh, those of us in the legislature can get back to work and refilling that opportunity. Because there are a lot of folks who aren't uh, severely affected uh, by, um, uh, you know, they're, they're not severely and persistently affected by mental illness, but nonetheless, they are struggling with mental illness. So even though they don't qualify for that full Medicaid housing benefit, uh, it would be wise and humane for us to make sure that we help those folks with supportive housing resources. It's gonna keep them on track. It's gonna keep them employed. It's gonna keep them housed. And it's gonna make sure that a small break doesn't result in a loss of housing, a loss of a job, a, a jail stay, which can really um, send these people uh, into, a, into a bad position. We're also working more on uh, expanding opportunities for legal aid and eviction prevention, which is a really important part of the whole network of services that keep people housed. Um, I would also say this is uh, not maybe directly related, but I think it's really important and it is related, which is that we just uh, approved $25 million in additional water affordability resources. Uh, there are a lot of folks who struggle to keep their water on. Water is very unaffordable in many of our communities. And so providing more resources to, um, to those uh, 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 needs are, 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 are important. Uh, I will also say that, you know, because uh, Democrats like you all, uh, knock on doors and made phone calls and we now have a majority uh, Democrats have gavels in their hands and I'm really proud to now chair a committee. Uh, in our first committee hearing, we reported out targeted tax relief for low income workers by expanding the state EITC from 6% to 30%. That's going to mean 500 to 700 additional dollars in the hands of uh, low income families, working families. And that's a really big deal. Uh, you know, Republicans are complaining about our tax policy and voting against it, but we're voting for targeted tax relief to people who really need it. Um, but we're also working on a number of other issues in housing and human services I'll try to cover quickly. One is we just reported out uh, my bill, Senate Bill 35, which is a bill to eliminate the asset test for food assistance. Uh, in order to be eligible for food assistance, it's a federal program, you need to be low income. And uh, what Michigan did, did many years ago during the Snyder administration, really as part and parcel of this whole Republican philosophy uh, against poor people, was we added this additional layer of bureaucracy in Michigan, some additional boxes to check that was called the asset test to make sure that people, even if they were very low income, make sure they didn't have some assets in the bank that would make them spend down before they'd be eligible for federal food assistance. I thought this was an idiotic policy in the first place. And when Snyder enacted it, it affected thousands of people and it knocked them off of food assistance. It turned money away from our state. It was just a blunder. Now, one of the first things that Governor Whitmer did when she got into office, and I really appreciated this, was she took that asset test limit under her authority and raised it up to a higher level, up to $15,000, so that it affects very, very few people. Um, and that, that's great, right? Uh, but uh, I wanna just eliminate this asset test from our books entirely. We shouldn't waste any time. We shouldn't waste um, 
uh, applicants time, uh, needy families time on, on this asset test. And we don't want to leave this asset test there in the law so that a future conservative governor can get in there and decide to turn down the screws on poor people, make it harder for them to get the federal food assistance that they're eligible for. So I'm really happy that that bill is on the way to the Senate floor. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, we're going to be able to pass that soon. Uh, we're also going to be working on some uh, taking hearings on some housing bills soon that relate to allocating some tax increment financing authority to people who build um, affordable housing. We're also going to work on some legislation to finally move forward a policy to prevent discrimination based on source of income. So if people have income from uh, Section 8 or if people have income from child support or if people have income as you know veterans benefits, that that can't be held against them uh, by their landlord. Uh, we're also working on uh, legislation to make sure that um, the benefits cliff and the harsh penalties that DHHS is required to levy on people for doing things like missing meetings or running afoul of their work requirements are relaxed. And we need to give more exceptions for things like childcare or other challenges that, that people are experiencing uh, uh, when they're replying for assistance from the state. So that's a quick rundown of some of the uh, important policies that we're working on in the Housing and Human Services uh, Committee and, and in the legislature to try to give more support to our local partners. Because I, I'll tell you, we've got some great local partners here in Washtenaw County. You're going to hear from them later, both in the um, nonprofit developer area and public housing and our local elected officials and uh, those of us in land are trying to provide them more resources to, to do what it is they're doing as well. So impressive. Uh, thank God the Democrats have the gavel. All, all of our hard work and we're going to keep the gavel in our hands. <laughs> um, the best way to so, keep the gavel um, in our hands is to do great things. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So we don't have time for questions follow up, following up immediately for uh, Senator Irwin, um, but hopefully we can get some of those questions in uh, during the program portion of the meeting. I love introducing uh, our U.S. Representative Debbie Dingell. I don't know what of the thousand things that are going on in D.C. <laughs> our Congresswoman wants to tell us about, but you have it's the floor. It's been crazy. Yeah. Um, it, and I'll try to be short. I did get to the Dexter Forum this morning, but I have no power, no cable, no internet at home. So uh. may it not be as long as it was for Teresa last week. Um, you know, it's been very intense. I mean, just if you look at the last two weeks here in Michigan, we shot down a UFO. We had the horrific shooting at Michigan State, which has been a catalyst again for the discussion of potential gun legislation in Washington. But I wouldn't hold your breath. I use Michigan and say to everybody, Michigan will get something done. We had a train derailment in Van Buren. Uh, we had hazardous waste from Ohio headed to us. Uh, we had no power. People still didn't have power yesterday and more people lost power. Many of us in Ann Arbor uh, last night. And uh, we have VA issues, veteran, the Veterans Hospital as well. So there have been a lot of local issues that I've really been focused on. And at the same time in Washington, we are on the defensive on many subjects. Re uh, Republicans are trying to gut NEPA. Uh, which is the, the one of the core bills for environmental protections. Uh, I've said I'm open to sitting down and modernizing, but what they've got on the table is totally gutting it. So that is going to be absolutely critical. Uh, I'm very, I am, I did not ask for, and uh, but am on the select committee on COVID uh, where we truly have um, the crazies at work. Uh, but what I'm more, well, that's going to be one of the more challenging assignments I've had. As I listened to everybody talk before I did, the public health crisis or public health for COVID expires in May, and people do not understand what the consequences of that will be from people that were put, were given SNP, more SNAP benefits because of it, access to vaccines and to medicines. COVID, you know, we may say we don't have a public health crisis on COVID. We may be done with COVID, but COVID's not done with us. And a lot of families that we care about are going to be deeply impacted about this. I am very concerned on, Greg, uh, Jeff talked about water affordability. 
you know, we've gotten a lot of money into the state from the federal level. Um, well, all the state legislators know this. I uh, say to the governor on a regular basis, we have to get those ARPA dollars spent, but we have money that we've gotten into the revolving water fund because water affordability is such a serious issue. And yet the groups have come to me and said, we're not spending it. We may not get it out there. So we've got to work with each of our counties uh, to make sure that people who need uh, access to help on affordable water can get it. And what I've learned in the last couple of weeks as I'm working this, that the LAHI programs that we've established are at HHS, but for some reason, these dollars are at Eagle and they're not, that's not their job to work with people who need access to things. So working on that as well, we're working on privacy legislation. We're working, we had good news. We, Lily, Eli Lilly dropped the price of insulin to everyone this week to $35. And that's what shows what happens when you have good policy. Medicare dropped it, capped it. We in the Congress, Republicans voted against it. I want to make that point. Capped it at $35. And by setting the precedent, Eli Lilly's coming to the table means that millions of families across the country are going to have access to insulin or not feel that impact that they have. Um, and we need to keep doing this. The Republicans say they're not trying to cut Medicare and Social Security, but they are trying to cut Medicaid, they're trying to cut access to many things. And I would say in Washington, we're on the defensive while still trying to get good things done too. So I'll be short because I know you've got an important program, but there's no shortage of work. So much going on. Questions for Representative Dingle? I know you've got them. Get your hands up. I do want to say this while you all put your hands up. Um, I think we need to use this hazardous waste crisis right now that they tried to send it to Michigan. So people are suddenly paying attention when they weren't. John Dingle tried to block this injection well in Romulus. It's up for certification right now. They had a public hearing and a public comment period and no elected official, no anybody filed comments. Now mm -hmm. everybody's concerned and I'm trying to get it reopened, but we need to use this to have a, discuss, a national discussion about whether hazardous waste should be stored in populated areas, start mm -hmm. there and go from there. And how do we ultimately try to, you know, PFAS in the last 10 years, we finally this year got, or last year in the last year, manufacturers to say they're not even gonna produce it. Because 10 years ago, nobody would talk about this. 98% of us have it. We are not using it in Teflon food, restaurants are not using it anymore in food storage containers, food wrappers, cosmetic manufacturers are stopping to use it. We need to get organized on trying to stop or eliminate the production longer term of these chemicals so we don't have to find a place to dispose them. Great. Any questions? I, I, in the absence of other specific questions, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing, and I'm sure a lot of people are, about the lived experience of a, of a Democratic representative in the current House, U.S. House. What, how are you managing? Well, I'm me. So I will always work across the aisle. I, I talk to all of my Republican friends. Um, you know, I, I, I treat everybody with respect. Uh, the hearings, I had two very difficult hearings this past week. One was in natural resources where they are trying to just accelerate. Uh, I mean, Joe Biden has to. I mean, I cannot believe he would ever uh, not veto uh, the bills that are in the Natural Resources Committee right now. But they are really trying to gut basic environmental protections we've had for 50 years. John Dingo wrote that bill. And, you know, we got to deal with how we're going to, you know, we can't be dependent upon China for batteries, for minerals, for batteries. So we got to, we got to work together, but the bills they've got are just horrific. Um, the COVID, the select committee on COVID was like, it, it I mean, it has a number of the, um, I'm, I'm going to, I try not to use names, but of uh, uh, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, 
and even the panel that they had were three of the doctors that there's, I'll send you, people should read the Washington Post description of the hearing this week. And, you know, I, I, I think we really need to get answers. I'm somebody, we don't know where COVID started. We don't know. I mean, we have a couple of agencies saying it could have come from a lab, but we need to be facts. We need to find the facts, not scare more people. You scare text to get more misinformation. And the biggest thing I'm concerned about right now on the climate on COVID is that we have people who aren't getting vaccinations on anything. We are seeing measles outbreaks. We are contributing to a level of hysteria in uh, public health that is going to impact our mm -hmm. the public health of our communities. Yeah. Um, thank you. If I, it, just reading about it is so painful. I can't, I struggle to imagine how frustrating it is to actually be there. Um, I'm Horace, I see your hand, but I'm gonna um, call on Janet Cannon first since she hasn't asked a question yet. Hi, just a very quick question. We tend to sort of think, well, they're doing all this crazy stuff, but there's no way any of it will ever get passed. And I'm picking up from what you just said that of course the, the largest part of the problem is the continuing to build the hysteria and continuing to build distrust. But are there things that they actually could find a way to pass? Well, I'm going to be very clear that home rule, yeah, we have a problem this week. Uh, I'm not happy about it. I'm going to be very uh, blunt. When we considered two of their proposals to override D.C. Um, City Council home rule on some crime issues, I voted to support home rule. The president... And by the way, they put out an administrative, the White House will put out positions on things uh, before we vote on things, had said that they were opposed. This week, we find out the president's not going to veto it. There are going to be multiple, significant number of Democratic senators that will support the Republicans on this. Now, look, I'm going to be very blunt, and I've said this to people. You need to look at what happened in Chicago and the defeat of the incumbent mayor. Crime is an issue that I keep, we have to stop making it either or. We need to deal that people want to live in a safe community. But we also know that there are significant problems in some communities. We have to deal with both of them. And I think crime will be a very significant issue uh, in the next election. I've said that to almost all of you at some point. But home rule, if you believe in home rule and you're not gonna go in the president's not going to come in and turn over what our state legislature did. There are a whole lot of things that Republican state legislatures are doing that we don't approve with. Start with choice. Um, so anybody who thinks that things can't happen, we saw that they can front and center. And a lot of us are very not happy. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Horst, we have, I'm sorry, I, can you put your question in chat, please? I need to move to, um, we need to transition to the main program. I do not want to give short sure. trip. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Just put it in chat so everybody can see it. And then whoever has a response can respond. Okay. Thank you very much. And Sarah Fink, you had a really interesting question to me about for Carrie Reingans. If you would put that in chat in general and Carrie can see it there. Um, I thought, you know, it was a great question, but we didn't get to it. Um, or you can send it directly to Carrie, but it'd be interesting for everybody to see it. All right, thank you so much to our legislators. I cannot wait until we're in person and can have our own conversations. But yes, thank you, Michael. A round of applause for our hardworking legislators. Uh, really great. We're so thankful to have you and for all of your incredible work. Um, and that goes for also the county commissioners, I'll say. I mean, the county commissioners are working their hearts out for us. And um, again, a whole solid democratic board and it's very impressive. Um, okay, so um, moving to the program portion, I am more than delighted to uh, turn this over to Kathy Wyatt, our good friend um, who's been working in housing and homelessness for longer than she probably wants me to say, and is the co-chair of with, um, with Mary Hall Sham of the WCDP's Committee on Outreach and Community Engagement, where she continues her work in homelessness. She knows everybody working in homelessness in Washtenaw County and 
she's chairing the program portion of our meeting. So thank you, Kathy, for all you do. Um, good morning, everybody. It is a pleasure to see you all on this Zoom. Um, it would have been even better to see you in person uh, and maybe have had a little bit less snow. Uh, so I, uh, my job is uh, for this program is a really um, pleasant one in that I get to introduce five panelists who um, are experts uh, who work in the field of housing and homelessness prevention, and who are also my friends. Um, and so I will uh, introduce, just go through the names and the order that people will present. I'll let you guys take it away from there. Um, I do have one thought just to add for all of those out there who in this past week or so lost power and didn't know where they were going to stay, who were scrambling to find a roof over their head or figure out how to, to feed uh, their kids in particular. Think about if this was an everyday occurrence where you literally had to focus all of your attention and resources on having a roof over your head, keeping warm, figuring out how you would feed uh, your kids and your family given those. So we have five people here um, who are going to talk about the crisis around housing and homelessness in Washington County and talk about possible solutions and talk about what we can do. And we as Democrats should be lead leading this charge and thank you, uh, Jeff Irwin. Um, I'm really, really glad you're the chair of the Senate Committee on Housing and Human Services. So the first person that will be going um, is Morgan Boydston from the Office of Community Economic Development. The second person that will be speaking will be the Honorable J. Cedric Simpson. Uh, Morgan and is going to talk, you know, set the stage uh, about the crisis for us. And of course, Cedric um, is a judge and will be talking about um, why the, the crisis is going to get worse, what he's seeing in his court. Um, Irene was, uh, Wash Judge Irene Washington was here a few months ago and uh, Told some heartbreaking stories, and uh, Judge Simpson will be talking, again, you know, about uh, the eviction crisis and what he's seeing around homelessness. And then we will uh, go to um, Aubrey Patino, from Executive Director of Avalon Housing, which houses so many folks um, uh, and is a passionate advocate for them. Uh, and then we'll have Amanda Carlisle. Uh, Executive Director of the Washington Housing Association, and Andy Labar, who care, who is a, a longtime member of our Board of Commissioners, and I really, really cares about the issue of homelessness and has for a long time, and can talk a little bit about um, what the Board of Commissioners can and should and will do. So uh, that's my my bit for today, uh, Morgan. Can you take it away? Greetings, all. Oh, I don't have the ability to share my screen, Kathy. Um, so I am going to take you through a quick PowerPoint presentation. It's only about five slides, but I'm going to set the context for the current crisis that we're experiencing in Washtenaw County. It is predominant. Yay, got it. Thank you. It is, um, we are most affected right now by our families in our system are being most affected by right now. And so I'm gonna prioritize my presentation on that population, though um, I can provide this group a link and at the end of the presentation, there is a link that shows you where you can see the data for the full system. So currently, um, these 440, well, not currently, as of the end of December, 448 people um, were, 
experiencing homelessness at the end of 2022. Um, that is an 8% increase from 2021. About 478 total persons were housed. That's about a 16% decrease from 2021. Um, that is due to, um, we had a lot of affordable housing units come online. Um, Aubrey AD at Avalon um, was a, played a huge part in helping us to get many people housed um, in 2021. Um, those units have since not come on, um, and it's a couple of years out before we'll see additional units come into our system. And the average days to get someone from intake to housing has was about 164 days. That is actually um, a decrease in days. So overall, that timing has decreased, but not for all populations. So I wanted to set the context a little bit pre-pandemic and now technically almost post-pandemic. In 2019, um, which is that top graph, you'll see the populations that are experiencing homelessness. Um, Non-chronic adults were actually experiencing homelessness at a higher rate than families. As you can see now, 2022, it is actually switched. Families are experiencing a higher proportion of homelessness in our county, um, and it, it's about, at this point, predominantly Black female-led families, which means about 85% of the children in our community are Black children who are experiencing homelessness. So again, while the number of homelessness from pre-pandemic to currently has not changed much, the demographics that are most affected right now has changed. And so the average length of time, and then this was at the end of December, this has actually increased some. The average length of time for a family to receive a housing resource from the moment that they call our intake line, which is Hawk for you all who are not familiar, Hawk is the housing access for Washington County. That is the coordinated entry point. So the moment a family calls that to the moment that they receive permanent housing is about 109 days. Um, so um, just under four months. We're also seeing a change in acuity of the families that are entering our system. So um, the SPDAT is a tool, an assessment tool that is used in order to um, assess someone's um, level of hopelessness, I think, to put in some layman's terms. Um, the families that are coming into our system are scoring, are scoring lower on the assessment tool, which means that there are more families in need, but it's taking less resources in order to um, attend to that that need. That is likely due to, and we um, are assuming it's more time will tell, but there was a lot of um, assistance in the pandemic, um, especially SARA funds, COVID emergency relief funds that uh, provided rental assistance, move-in cost, um, and in some cases sheltering for families for up to 18 months that are no longer in play in our community. And so as we look at the demographics, again, um, about 76% of the families that are experiencing homelessness are Black female-led households. We also see now a 4% increase in Hispanic and Latino, or not increase, I'm sorry, 4% of the population experiencing homelessness in Washtenaw County um, in 2022 were Hispanic and Latino. Now, I am pointing that out. It's significant because we have not been able to capture that high of a rate in the past, and that's because we worked with an organization, Buenos Vecinos, um, through 2020 through 2020, I guess currently actually, who provided translation services for families. So it wasn't that these families didn't exist or that the need changes that we finally had resources to provide to those families to be able to access our system. Um, we are also noting that the family size is changing over time. And so that's significant because that also means that's a change or an increase in the units or I'm sorry, an increase um, bed need per family. So what I'm saying is that uh, 2021, it was an average, or 2020 was an average of three persons per household. That could be a two-bedroom apartment or two-bedroom unit house. Um, we are averaging close to four people per household. And what that means is you are now, um, families are needing an increase from two bedrooms to three or four bedrooms, which is a significant rental increase or rent or cost to the family. And we don't necessarily have units that um, can house that many folks in community and or they're scarce. 
And so I want to talk to you a little bit about what this cost means. Um, so for some of you who are aware, Barrier Busters is a um, fund that is run out of the Office of Community and Economic Development, and it provides um, assistance, rental assistance, um, and when our COC or our housing system cannot attend or, or the household is not eligible, it provides um car repair. It can provide, in some cases, babysitting money. It's a very flexible fund to help a household who was in crisis, a one-time relief fund. We have been using those funds in order to leverage households who are experiencing homelessness, acknowledging that Sarah dollars are no longer in play. So because of that, an average, um, there's about an average of 12K spent weekly in eviction prevention and rental requests. And these are for households, again, that have housing subsidies already that are not eligible for our homelessness of care systems funding sources. Um, and it's for households that exceed our local um, allocation of 2K per, per family. And so um, as you look over emergency solutions, um, grants are grants that come from MISHTA and HUD. MISHTA is the Michigan State Housing Development Authority in order to attend to eviction assistance and um, provide some rental assistance. So again, the maximum of the average cost we provided to family has been about $2,400. The ESG maximum is about um, 3K. We've increased it recently to do that. That 2466 number does not include leverage funds from barrier busters. When we leverage funds with barrier busters, average household is about $3,900 in order to attend to their current crisis. Though that ranges, we've seen households needing as little as $700 to most recently we had a family come in needing assistance up to $10,000. Um, that leverage number with barrier busters also doesn't include other community organizations that help and assist families with um, rental assistance. And the average move-in cost that a family might need is around uh, $2,700. Uh, $2, so what we're seeing is that it's not huge buckets of funds that families are needing in order to attend to their crisis, but more families are needing it. Um, and the trends are ongoing. Rent costs are continuing to increase. Family sizes are, continuing, are continuing to increase, um, but the market it cannot ex um, is not supporting the family sizes. Um, even um, in our current wait list, we had, I pulled the numbers, there's about 210 families right now waiting um, that we know of that come through the Hawk system that are waiting for assistance. If we served a quarter of those families, it would not put a dent in that there is this is still we're maintaining a highest wait list um, than we previously seen. And there is little to no affordable housing coming onto the market. Um, so again, here's the link if you are interested in seeing a more expansive data of all populations, but I want to pass it over to Judge Simpson so he can help show and paint the picture how we are seeing this in his courts. He and I meet often, so I'm a little scared what he's going to say, but I'm going to pass it over to you, Judge Simpson. Judge, you're muted. I said some brilliant things just now and nobody heard them. But anyway, um, good morning. Um, it, it's certainly a pleasure to be here um, and particularly to talk about this issue. And as Morgan indicates, uh, we meet at least monthly um, and share our ideas of how we can eliminate, uh, or not eliminate, but certainly stem some of the issues that we've had um, recently. And when I say recently, particularly within the past five or six years regarding homelessness and regarding the issue of maintaining individuals in their home. Um, that is sort of the biggest focus, at least for me, and I think for my colleagues, Judge Washington and Judge Valvo, is trying to figure out ways to uh, have people maintain their housing. As, as Morgan indicates, and we've sort of had to coordinate what really happens in the court with what they do. One of the figures that uh, Morgan had on her slide was the 100, 109 days from the time of initial contact with Hawk to assistance. And we in the courts had to be very blunt and say we that time frame had to be closed. We had to get people into the system. We had to, where they needed assistance, it had to happen um, 
is sort of quicker than that. And, and I applaud Morgan because um, she, she made that happen. Um, and we're actually getting more assistance when people are in the court uh, because of her efforts. So she shouldn't be scared of what I'm gonna say. I, I wanna certainly compliment her in, in that regard. I would also point out to everyone that um, in addressing this issue, the courts, um, myself along with my colleagues, are looking at ways in which we can actually be of assistance in um, providing a, the court process to eliminate evictions. Now to place that in context for you this past week, uh, and it's, it's probably one of the most difficult parts of my job, um, I've had to sign 30 eviction notices. Uh, the reality of that is, is that those individuals that are there um, and that I'm signing these for, I have no idea where they are. I have no idea whether or not they've obtained other housing. Um, I have no idea whether or not they've obtained other assistance. I mean, I have to make the presumption that they're going to be um, dislocated from the current situation that they're in if they haven't uh, indeed already left. Um, that is really, a because of the closure, that 30 just for my court is really about a the number for about a week and a half. So every 10 days, um, we're getting about 30. And you can't delay in signing them by law. I, have to issue the orders of eviction. Um, you can't, uh, you know, there are certain things that people would like the courts to do. We can't do. Uh, the law won't prevent us or won't allow us to do it. Um, but I think all of us have been creative in trying to figure out ways to, 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 to sort of stop the not stop the process, but allow the process to continue, but allow people to maintain their housing. One of the things particularly that I do, and again, to kind of give you context, because you have to understand for the courts, I see a fraction in my courtroom, I see a fraction of really what the problem is. Um, there are many other people out there, and, and we're all aware of that, that are in dire straits. And those individuals are some of the people that, that Morgan's dealing with. Um, there are those that for whatever reason haven't touched base with any agency whatsoever. So I'm seeing a fraction, but I, I kind of divide them into different categories. And one of the categories is there are those that are in serious trouble, particularly in non-payment of rent cases. They're not going to be able to pay. They're they're their circumstances are such that uh, within the time frame that I have, the court process really cannot help them. Um, that's a, a small fraction, but it is certainly a fraction of the people that we see in court. There are then those that are on the other end of the spectrum that really ran into a bump, but financially, they're relatively in good shape. They just need, say, a 30-day period. They don't need any assistance. Um, they, they just need to sort of buy time, and they'll be okay. That, again, is, for those in court, is a small fraction. We then have the biggest piece, which are, just are those in the middle. And, and they vary um, in a lot of ways. And this is where... Um, the Office of Economic Development is, is exceedingly helpful. They've fallen behind. They're in a situation economically where they, without some help, they will never catch up. And the, the, the primary goal in those cases is to what I call get them to ground zero. And once you get them to ground zero, then they will be able to maintain. Um, a lot of people want to jump on landlords about this or jump on tenants. From the court's perspective, at least my perspective, it, it's going to take a joint effort. 
And for the most part, the landlords in Washtenaw County um, have been, um, if not cheerfully embracing what the court does, they've at least been cooperative in the process. Um, they understand that this person has to sort of climb out of this hole they find themselves in and get there and get to ground zero and then they will be able to maintain. Uh, the, the problem with uh, when that happens and what we are running into is what are the ever rising rental costs. So even once this person and we're finding a number of cases where we've gone through our process, gotten them to that point of ground zero. Now they should be able to, absent some emergency or absent some other circumstances, uh, maintain their housing. It will be a struggle, but they can maintain their housing um, only to find out that they're at the lease of their, they're at the end of their lease period and their rent has gone up 50%. And at that point, the landlord or the tenant, it, there's no way that they're going to maintain. And so they're either going to be out um, or they've got to find some other housing. Problem with trying to find other housing is a lot of times it's just not there. They, they don't fall into any category that anybody is placing great priority on. Um, and they're just going to be out at some point. And, you know, it, Anybody that wants to tune into any of these, uh, the landlord tenant courts really should take a while and, and look at a minor streamed um, on YouTube. And you'll see the different stories of the individuals that come before the court. You'll actually be able, it, it's kind of nice to kind of talk about this in terms of policy, but you'll, be, you'll see the human being that's there. They're not just some sort of figure out there or some imaginary thing. Um, I like Morgan, although I have to be careful in some of my comments, but you know, I, I'll just say it. Uh, the reality is, is, is that who I'm seeing in my court are black and brown women with children um, who are in jeopardy of losing their housing. That's, that's who I, I'm seeing. And for the most part, and it's how to figure out a way to do that. I could tell you a lot of horror stories. I could tell you a lot of uh, stories that are uh, sad in, in the sense of uh, what ultimately will happen with these individuals or where they're headed or the, the very fact and the sort of the scariest thing of where they don't know where they're headed. Um, sometimes that can do some good, sometimes it can't. But one of the things I, I do want to point out to you is that, um, and, and I'll always say this for the most part, that I'm proud of this county. I'm proud of the, from all levels, which is one of the most interesting things, is from all levels, everybody is attempting to try to address this problem. Um, you don't see that everywhere. I talk to other judges around the state, and that's not happening. Um, I see the Board of Commissioners looking at it. I see the courts looking at it. Um, the landlord attorneys or representative from the landlord attorneys or legal services, um, all trying to find some common ground to help uh, alleviate the pain that's going on. One of the things, and I'll try to end on a, a bit of a happier note, um, the three judges, myself, Judge Washington and Judge Valvo, all got together and, and we are going to, um, once we obtain the funding to do so, we are going to provide sort of a separate docket, which we're going to call our housing docket. And it will, be, it will go along the lines of a specialty court uh, that will take some of those problem cases, some of those, those cases that in the normal confines of um, what we have to do on our landlord tenant docket, we can't deal with and kind of be able to pay special attention to those individuals and sort of lead them through a process 
um, and not make it a process where we're just sort of throwing money at it to alleviate the, the initial pain, although that may happen. Um, but to get them into a situation or try to lead them into a situation where they can sustain their housing. Um, it certainly is going to take some cooperation on behalf of landlords. It's going to take, uh, which I have received uh, from the largest landlord, a, a commitment to work with us to do that, uh, which was probably the biggest challenge. Uh, we'll be working with legal services and other um, groups to try to make sure that we can do that. Um, I'm a proud of I'm proud of that initiative on behalf of myself and my fellow judges. I think it's the kind of thing that this day and age courts should be doing. Um, and we're also seeking um, assistance, like I said, to start this from Washington County, but also from the National Center uh, for State Courts to try to address this. So. We're, I think, headed in the right direction. I don't know that we're moving fast enough. I mean, I'm kind of sometimes like a bull in a china shop. I want it done tomorrow, but I realize that it can't happen that way. And what we're hoping is, is that there isn't um, significant damage and significant pain in, inflicted in the, the process and everything while we try to um, put something in place. So. That's where we are at the appropriate point. I'm more than happy to take anybody's questions um, regarding what the courts do. Great, thanks Judge Simpson. Appreciate all your, all your work. Um, my name is Aubrey Patino. I'm the executive director of Avalon Housing. For those of you who don't know, Avalon, um, we're a real estate developer, service provider, and property manager owner of what's called permanent supportive housing. Our mission is to build healthy, safe, inclusive, supportive housing communities as a long-term solution to homelessness. We've been doing it for over 30 years. Um, we own 29 properties throughout the county. And in addition to the properties we own and manage, we partner with the private landlord market. So we provide HUD subsidy typically, or what's called rapid rehousing, which is short-term case management, short-term rent assistance to subsidize people's rent in the mar private market and then provide them with the same level of supportive services they would get if they were living in supportive housing. In addition to that, we're also the on-site service provider to the Ann Arbor Housing Commission at particular locations where they have created a homeless set aside and um, turned a subset of their housing into supportive housing. So this just gives you a sense of where we're working throughout the county. Um, you'll see that all of the, the properties that Avalon owns currently are in the city of Ann Arbor, Dexter, or Chelsea. Um, and then uh, where we're serving uh, in public housing units are located in Ann Arbor, but that there's a pretty big presence throughout the private market all over the county um, where we are um, supporting people in that way. And I think I just want to note um, per the comment earlier about kind of what is unique about our community strategy and what has worked well, that we are willing to leverage any and all options inclusive of the private market, our public housing partners, as well as um, uh, nonprofit uh, developers and supportive housing folks like Avalon. Good news is we have four more developments in the pipeline. It's not enough, but it's something. Um, so the Grove at Viridian, 50 units, that's gonna be mostly for families. 10 of those units are gonna be for young people served by Ozone House. So young people coming out of homelessness, um, construction's underway. 206 North Washington is a development in which we're in the process of applying for um, funding. That's, we're looking to put about 20 units in the city of Ypsilanti. That'll be our first development in the city of Ypsilanti, which is very exciting. Um, and then 121 East Catherine, downtown um, residential infill site in Carytown. And um, that's, we're looking to do 63 units there. And then we have a third phase of a development mentioned earlier, Hickory Way. Hickory Way is 70 units that we list, leased up in uh, 2020 in Ann Arbor. When we leased up Hickory Way to give everybody just frame of reference about the impact of housing and homelessness, we saw a point in time reduction in chronic homelessness in Washtenaw County of 31%. So one development reduced chronic homelessness by 31% at a point in time. Um, and we're going to um, do another phase of development there at a, um, a parcel of land that we own and are just in the process of um, doing pre-development work on now. So um, we serve about 170 families now, about 200 kids, and the rest of the folks that we serve are um, single adults, 
And these are folks living throughout the county, as I mentioned earlier. Since about 2015, pretty much everyone that Avalon works with is coming out of what we call chronic homelessness. That means that they've had four episodes of homelessness or more over the last three years, or they've been homeless a year or more and have a disabling condition. Um, what we do uh, is called Housing First. Housing First is something that is a, it's a proven strategy. There's now decades of evidence uh, behind this strategy. What is um, profoundly frustrating about working in this field um, is that actually uh, we understand all of the technocratic uh, solutions to homelessness because it's actually profoundly simple. Housing ends homelessness, right? Um, we know how to produce affordable housing. We know how to serve people uh, with extensive periods of homelessness, living with psychiatric or addictive adaptations to trauma. Um, we have demonstrated the effectiveness of that approach. And yet people still find themselves um, uh, not always in alignment with Housing First at a community level, and that's a problem. And so I just encourage us to continue to lean into Housing First as the only and best proven strategy to addressing this issue. Um, what's great about it is that it works. 97% of the folks at Avalon House stay housed. It's also more cost effective um, than jail, shelter, um, or even just letting people be unsheltered, often by virtue of their ER visits or visits to the jail. Um, so uh, rent subsidy plus services costs about 11000 a year for a single household. Um, if you spend a year in a shelter in our community, that's going to cost us about $29,000. How did we get here? You know, I just want to real quick highlight, you know, big picture. Um, we're, we're today we're really, you know, focusing on the fact that over 1400 people experienced homelessness in our community in 2022, that we're facing this crisis with families and folks um, just uh, haven't seen anything like of really what's going on in, in the eviction courts. Um, but big picture, you know, it's been a long time coming, starting first and foremost with the commodification of housing. Um, a total divestment in public and subsidized housing and overemphasis on individual home ownership. And then just the rise in, in speculative activity. I saw a great question in the chat around how many venture capitals own our housing stock. Great question. Would love to know. Um, and then, you know, what happened? Well, good folks doing the work uh, were asked to create these plans to end homelessness. And so some of you may be around for that. Um, I, I was, and I, uh, you know, you, you're, we were weary, but hopeful that we could end homelessness in 10 years. The thing about that is um, folks in the homeless response sector don't have a lot of control about the feeders into homelessness. So um, also cities and counties can't do this alone. And most of those plans were very municipal based. That is not to say that we can't be doing more or better, or have a more cohesive strategy at a local level but thinking about what is the federal level of investment on the issue and how that trickles down and its impact on all of us. And then um, frankly, we've had a pretty colorblind approach to ending homelessness and that's a huge problem. Systemic racism plays a significant role in rates of homelessness uh, is causal to homelessness amongst people of color and research on that, bringing that to the forefront and attention of the sector is really new. It's only been in the last five years um, that, that, um, that, that, that that is something that has really even become a part of the national conversation. And, um, and so uh, that's, you know, that's something that has to be looked at um, in every dimension of our response. So locally, you know, just thinking about this morning, you know, what are some things that I don't think other people might say, but maybe they will, but that I, I could say about what, what I would love to see happen here. You know, one is that I do think we need a 100% commitment to housing first uh, throughout the county. Um, I think that we need a regional strategy. We need something that is, we're all moving towards the same North Star. What is that? It doesn't need to be, a, you know, some ridiculous pie in the sky 10 year plan. It could be as simple as a three year plan where there's one to three strategies we're implementing each uh, year over the next three years, but something that's objective, um, that feels um, informed, um, that is in alignment with best practices, and that is moving us towards a more regional approach to addressing this issue. Um, but the, the reality is, is of course, you know, in the pandemic and with what all of us providers have faced, um, you know, we're always dealing with what is right in front of us. And I think we really need something more to, to try to move us towards collectively. When we, and if we can make a countywide commitment to housing first, then I think that will help us 
um, make good decisions when resources do become available to us. So for example, right now with home ARPA funding, you know, I'm pretty confident that that's going to lean into a commitment to housing first. That's incredibly exciting. You know, I'm really grateful for that. There was other funding um, ARPA allocation that didn't that didn't align with housing first, but was categorically um, identified as uh, funding for housing and homelessness. And so I think those are things that, you know, perhaps wouldn't happen if we had a regional strategy that we're all committed to. Treating coordinated entry, what we know locally is housing access of Washtenaw County, um, like a command center in a climate emergency. Last week, I thought it was incredible. I'm really proud of our community. We had multiple daytime shelters and overnight shelters available uh, within hours for folks. Thank goodness. That was a hugely advantageous resource for all of the folks that Avalon works with. And we know that we can do that. That's amazing. There's um, examples where Seattle being one that I encourage everybody to go and look at and read about their command center. It's totally transforming how they do the work of what we call coordinated entry. So that's identifying who's homeless, what's their level of need, and how are we allocating resources. Um, take a look at what they're doing. It's pretty, it's pretty transformative. I think that that we could, you know, we could think more expansively around what does that look like. And then funding um, the homeless response sector workforce to the rate of inflation. So one of the things that I know we're not unique or alone in um, is that the helping professions have been decimated. The behavioral workforce has been decimated. Avalon Housing has not been fully staffed in three years, um, not once. <laughs> um, I have 10% of folks who work at Avalon right now left and came back because they love the culture. That's fantastic. Most of them had to take a pay cut to do so. That's unacceptable. So the, what we can pay people is not enough to retain them. Um, the work is hard. It takes it takes you, you know strategy, competence, uh, compassion, a whole set of skills that are pretty complex, and we need we need enough money to be able to pay what people deserve. Um, we're not alone in that. That is the case across the entire sector, inclusive of the people answering the phone at Hawk. So when we're all really upset about how <laughs> how frustrating things can be at Hawk, they're 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 also dealing with turnover and challenges with retention and being able to get people in the front door. And that's not that that's not you know unique to any of us. Um, some of what's happened around increasing compensation might get to say Medicaid build providers, but that's not going to get to folks in the homeless response sector. So thinking expansively about how can we, and I want to just, you know, um, acknowledge an example where Senator Irwin has um, earmarked $6 million for supportive housing services. That's incredible. For the providers who will get that resource, it will mean reduced caseloads. It will mean increased wages. The quality of services people will receive will be exponentially better. More of that. And then, you know, we, we do in fact have to build, build, build. We have to take every win we can get. And I think that there, there can be a lot of, um, uh, there can be things that might not have the appearance of a win that are a win. <laughs> so sometimes, um, you know, uh, example would be, uh, you know, for, you know, rooming houses in an historic district commission. This was brought to Ypsilanti City Council last week. Um, it's complicated. There's some concerns. They're valid concerns. What can we do to address those concerns but not have what could be a potential housing resource for a lot of our folks um, unavailable to them? So every win counts. This is to some extent, death by a thousand cuts. We don't have any wiggle room to not take every single win. Um, dedicating funding for people to purchase land and develop. The county owns a lot of land. All the land needs to be looked at and the, the land needs to be vetted for affordable housing development. Um, and th the city of Ann Arbor is a beautiful example of what that looks like. We got a millage passed. We've looked at all of the parcels. We have a plan to develop every single, every single parcel that is capable of being developed. Great. We need every other municipality to mimic that. Um, we got to look at land use and zoning policies. Multifamily housing by right would help us increase housing supply and, and decrease costs. And then I think every municipality should take a hard look at their development process. How quick is it? Are there ways in which if you're a nonprofit mission focused developer, things can move any more quickly? What might be standing in the way of getting more units developed? And then of course, I just have to make a plug because the Vera Institute and Nation Outside are working on Fair Chance Access to Housing Act. I'm sure you're all in support of that, but would encourage support of that at the state level. Thanks, I'm gonna turn it over to Amanda. Thank you. Um, 
everyone who's spoken before and all um, thank you for having all of us this morning. I am with the Washtenaw Housing Alliance and WHA is a coalition of nonprofit and government organizations that are working to end homelessness here in Washtenaw County. Um, as a coalition, WHA's work over the past many years has been around developing and implementing the community's plan to end homelessness that Aubrey talked about, um, fundraising $8 million to build the Robert J. Delanis Emergency Shelter and Resource Center, um, developing the original housing access for Washtenaw County, our coordinated entry system, and working to propose and get past the Ann Arbor Affordable Housing Millage in 2020. Uh, through a state grant the community received several years ago, the WHA worked with a consultant, the Corporation for Supportive Housing, to create a needs assessment and gaps analysis of temporary and permanent housing solutions in Washtenaw County um, within our homeless system of care. And so I wanted to share a little bit um, about that with you all this morning. Um, so not surprisingly, based on others' presentations this morning, the system modeling report identifies major resource gaps for permanent housing and temporary housing for our neighbors experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. The report identifies that we need an increase in permanent housing resources with 284 slots of what's called shelter diversion or eviction prevention, 886 slots annually of rapid rehousing, which is a short uh, to medium term housing and services interve intervention in the housing first philosophy, and then 871 new units of permanent supportive housing, which Aubrey shared more about that Avalon and others in our community do, but it's a long term housing and services intervention that's evidence based. The report identifies we also need to increase our temporary housing uh, resources of 58 emergency shelter slots for adults and 128 emergency shelter slots for families. And I wanted to point out that the only area in our gaps analysis uh, that identified where we had an excess of resources is for temporary beds for homeless veterans. Uh, this report, uh, um, the analysis has also been seen in real life, like kind of with utilization of our veteran temporary beds declining. And as such, one of our veteran temporary housing providers, Michigan Ability Partners, has taken the kind of quick action to figure out how to convert one of its veteran sites to fill another system need, uh, likely family homelessness. More on that to come because it's a kind of in process right now. But um, why I point that out is that since the Obama administration declared a desire to end homelessness among veterans in 2010, veterans homelessness has been resourced with robust federal funding in housing first programs like supportive housing and rapid rehousing and eviction prevention for veterans. Veterans also have access, as we know, uh, you know, mostly to health care through the VA, which is a critical component to helping folks. Um, and so we must really build on the successes and the lessons learned from efforts to decrease veteran homelessness by developing new housing in line with our newest report that shows it's, it's needed and investing in the services that keep people housed, including providing physical and behavioral health care that meets the needs of those experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. So I wanted to keep it short and let you all know about sort of that resource gap. Those, um, This report will be published very soon and we'll have it on WHA's website as well as the county's continuum of care website that Morgan shared with you earlier. Um, so look for that later this month, but you all um, get the preview um, of what is needed in our community. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Andy Labar. Thanks, Amanda. Um, and thanks, Kathy, for organizing this panel. Um, Kathy delicately put that I'm a, a long-term member of the Board of Commissioners. And I just want to um, say, I certainly don't speak on behalf of the board, but I think uh, Crystal and Caroline, Annie and Justin, and the rest of our colleagues uh, share a consensus that homelessness Response and prevention is something that falls uh, very much in line with the county's commitment around human services and is an issue that um, we continue to grapple with and seek to be proactive on, uh, but in many cases uh, are, are, are forced to be responsive. Um, I'm also uh, in a joint role as a member of the Community Mental Health Board. Uh, CMH does a lot of work 
with the homeless community. And it is primarily on the front end in terms of identifying those individuals uh, who are uh, homeless and, 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 and living where human habitation is not uh, certainly a, you know, a good choice or possible, but uh, obviously they are there for a number of reasons. Uh, through the PATH program, uh, CMH, which is the outreach arm of the continuum of care, uh, helps to, to, to get in touch with these folks to complete a verification for those adults who are, who are literally homeless, um, to get them enrolled uh, along with a mental health assessment and verification for a, for a severe mental health illness, uh, get them enrolled with the programs that will seek to try and be helpful with them. Um, the, the, the problem obviously is that one, as Morgan put in the, in the chat, um, homelessness is not tied to, uh, geography and we're seeing more and more, uh, what used to be a homeless population that would be in centered around the downtown and Arbor area, uh, because of some of the physical changes in infrastructure in the area, uh, and because of some of the underlying economic uh, conditions, those those individuals are being uh, interacted with further and further out geographically in the county, places like Ypsilanti Township and Pittsfield. And um, it, it is it is not the same challenge that it was years ago. So I, I'm going to put in the chat uh, information on the new human services partnership. Uh, the county for about 10 years participated along with the city of Ann Arbor, uh, the United Way, and uh, um, I'm, I'm black, or Urban County, forgive me, uh, and then eventually uh, St. Joe's in what was called uh, the coordinated funding effort. This was an attempt to try, uh, obviously, and coordinate our human services response across those uh, entities to try and make, make most effective use of dollars. The last several years, starting in 2020, uh, COFU coordinated funding uh, dissolved with, uh, the, excuse me, the community foundation uh, taking itself out of that, that partnership. In response, the county has put together with the city and with Urban County, uh, the new human services partnership. This is an effort to try and focus our human service efforts, including uh, homelessness provence, uh, pre prevention and response in ways that focus on trying to move the needle on racism, poverty, and trauma as areas where uh, we, are, we are trying to, to get to those root causes. That is somewhat complicated by the fact that we are using a, a five-year time frame on that program to, to try and move the needle and then demonstrate response. Uh, what we have though in the intervening time is an immediate crisis in terms of trying to get those individuals who are homeless now or at risk of homelessness, uh, the resources they need. The county will be grappling with that. Uh, I suspect we're likely to get a proposal to try and stand up additional funding in addition to what we're spending on new human services partnership. Um, the interplay with community mental health deals with some of the programs that the mental health millage uh, is helping to fund. And th those many times get uh, overlooked because CMH is doing a lot of great work with, uh, with those funds. Um, but there's been over a million dollars from millage funding uh, towards projects through uh, entities like Avalon, uh, Ozone House, the Family Empowerment Center. Uh, we've we've done homelessness diversion efforts with that millage fund. Um, some of the things that we do through our crisis uh, cares team, uh, including hotel stays for individuals uh, and families in crisis. Over the last three winters, uh, we have we have helped over 1,100 individuals uh, to the tune of about $330,000. Uh, with those hotel stays. Um, and that's good, but that's certainly not a long-term solution. And I would echo Aubrey's points in terms of, one, municipalities uh, coming to the table and opening up development 
uh, in ways in which we can maximize uh, the ability to have truly affordable housing. Um, and, and, and two, uh, ways in which municipalities and the county, uh, like we did uh, uh, at Platte Road, can look at their own land for development uh, and see if, if they can be a part of the solution. Let me end because I know we've, we, we, we want to get to Q&A and so forth, but I would say Morgan presented at the last Board of Commissioners working session two weeks ago on some of what OCED is now doing directly uh, in homelessness response and particularly the call center. Uh, there is so much more to do and habitually Office of Community and Economic Development at the county level um, has been understaffed uh, because candidly, there's so much work it does. And in many ways, it is sort of a, 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 a catch all to a lot of programs uh, that, that are vital, uh, but there's just never enough resources to, to go around. And that's been exacerbated with the dissolution of coordinated funding. The Board of Commissioners is grappling with that. Um, but we certainly need input from the citizenry broadly uh, and, and, and folks like the Dems specifically uh, to, to try and have us continue uh, to advocate for putting county resources uh, there to meet those immediate needs. So I've, I've, I've probably gone overly long, but Kathy, thank you again. And uh, just want to give a, a, a quick thank you to Morgan, to Amanda, to Judge Simpson. Uh, and to Aubrey, uh, they are experts in this field, and uh, glad to glad to be with them. So uh, I reiterate what um, Andy just said, and thank you so much, Morgan, Aubrey, Amanda, Judge Simpson, and Andy. So uh, now is the time for folks to ask questions. Um, you can uh, raise your hands. Uh, and um, I know there have been questions in the chat. Uh, if you could, those who have asked them, put them in the chat, could you please raise your hands and ask them again? Um, I see uh, Ian, um, could you uh, unmute you? Yeah, way. thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you for all of the presentations, which really helped me to understand where we are at this point in more detail than I have understood up to now, which is super helpful. I recognize this is a really important issue and uh, you know, the labor movement wants to work to help address this issue in whatever ways we can. So I'm curious if people have thoughts about how we might help with that. But I also note that we got through this entire discussion without a single mention of the largest employer in our county, University of Michigan. And I'd like to know what can you, how has U of M contributed to this problem and what can U of M do about it? I mean, we owe you a phone call, Ian. Um, I know you're working on this issue. Um, super appreciate it. I think, you know, the just the to be, keep it really basic, um, the, the U of M has not um, produced enough housing for its students. So um, like how the tech industry impacted, you know, Silicon Valley, affordable housing, U of M impacts affordable housing in our community because um, students um, need housing too, deserve housing too, also deserve affordable housing. Um, and the university can and should be playing a far more proactive role in developing housing. They own a tremendous amount of land to do so and have the resources to do so on the land that they own. So that's the simplest answer. I'm sure others may have more to say. They've increased enrollment every year without addressing this issue as well. And yes, it's burdening the, 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 the private market in huge ways. Does that answer your question, Ian? That's the short answer. <laughs> um, certainly it is. Uh... <laughs> should be part of an overall discussion that encompasses the role of unions and many, 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 many other partners in Washtenaw County. Um, Annie, I think you were next. Can everybody hear me? Well, I don't have a, a question. I just wanted to thank all the panelists. Um, 
for doing this on a Saturday morning. And one thing that I just want to uplift um, when we're talking about what everybody um, in the party can do in labor in particular, um, as a former Ypsilanti city council person and a now commissioner, um, one of the things that we face on city council over the summer when we were approving a over 300 a unit affordable housing development, half of which is senior, half is family, uh, we got a lot of pushback. Um, we had to deal with a lot of people, um, you know, not understanding, you know, the need, even though Ipsy does have a lot of the county's affordable housing, the city, and we're small, um, why we chose to go that way. And the, the vote on that was 4-3. Um, and I'll just point out that the four council people who supported that pilot program on Clark Road in the city that will create um, over 300 units, we were all millennials. Um, there was a huge generational divide on that. Um, and then additionally, I'll just bring up, um, we're really excited, um, I, although I can't speak for city council because I'm not a member anymore, but I know that folks in Ipsy are really excited about Avalon coming to our community. Um, again, we had a lot of pushback in the community um about that um development coming in on washington so as that project continues to move forward and people in the community um try to inflict fear around what supportive housing is i would appreciate if folks could help us um explain to others what supportive housing is and why it's important um in addition to all types of affordable housing um, and we really do need our partners um, in the townships to start helping um, because the city of Ipsy does not have any more room um, to, to build. We have a little bit left on Water Street, um, but we really do need help um, from others. Thank, thank you, Annie. Um, she is no longer a Ipsy city council person, but she is on our board of commissioners and is chief of staff for Senator Jeff Irwin. Um, and thank you for Ipsy City for being as proactive as you are to get more supportive housing into that area and into the east side. Um, Sarah uh, Thornburg, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, first, I wanted to echo Annie's thanks for everybody who was on the panel and who shared and I also, as a Ipsy Township resident, want to echo what Annie just said, that the township needs to get on board with the city and start looking at their properties for development as well. But I did put a question in the chat. Um, I'm still perplexed as to why the ARPA designation for housing and homelessness of 1.4 million was um, unanimously approved by the county commission to go to many, many, many programs that have nothing to do with housing and homelessness. And I'm hearing this morning, this discussion, I'm more perplexed than ever. So I would appreciate if Commissioner Labar could address that. Sure, and, and, and Sarah, thanks for the question. I, I, I think uh, the allocation you're talking about, and please correct me if, if, if I'm wrong, um, this was the 1.4, that we approved through ARPA dollars for what we what we termed uh, addressing housing and homelessness to uh, groups like here on Valley Pace, um, House by the Side of the Road, uh, and 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 others. Um, with the ARPA allocations, we tried to listen to the recommendations of staff in terms of where they thought uh, dollars would be most effective to address some of these issues. Um, one of the challenges that we heard habitually through the use of coordinated funding was, while it was certainly uh, a, a good effort with, with great partners at the table, it was hard if you weren't already being funded through coordinated funding to, to, to get funding to do that new work. Um, and particularly if you were a small and, and, and newly created nonprofit. Um, we, we are trying through New Human Services Partnership uh, and have tried through the ARPA allocations in the past uh, to, to bring in new partners with, with uh, funding from the county. Um, in terms of whether or not they will be effective, uh, I, I don't know, I think that will, I think that will vary. Um, but the, the designation that I put there in the chat uh, spells out a bit about uh, what we funded, how much, 
Uh, and then I can certainly provide greater detail offline in terms of what, what those entities are using that funding for uh, specifically. Uh, but, it, but it's our hope that the work they do uh, will have value and, and, and will impact that. Um, we are always looking for feedback, though, and uh, folks like you are, are, are folks on the ground who can, who can give it, and we, we certainly welcome it. Um, what we know is the, the, the county and other partners have not you know, solved the issue of homelessness. There's more work to do and uh, work that can always be done uh, better, we hope. Yeah, I guess my primary concern was that there was over half of that money went to programs that, and I've read all the, you know, the the community priority fund appro approved proposal and everything went to after school programs. And I just, I don't see how that addresses when, when we just heard, you know, Judge Simpson and Morgan talk about the number of families led by black and brown women with children. Um, how that helps them get housing. So that was my concern. I appreciate your answer, but um, I, I need to raise that concern. Thank you, Sarah and Andy. Um, Janet, I believe you were next. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've been following a little side conversation with Rosanita concerning, and so, I just wanted to point out that it's it's sort of hard sometimes to get our head around that it's like in a sense there's two very different populations people who are suffering from chronic homelessness or who are out of their apartments and those who are struggling to stay in them because just the economic pressures so there's often many different factors for those who end up outside some of it's economic some of it's not and that's how the supportive and the and the housing first approach are so important that for the, the bigger problem and what I think is even rising is the families who simply are caught between the two forces of years of wages staying low and unions not having leverage and and then costs rising on the other side. And it sort of feels like they're just going to throw all those people away. You know, <laughs> what are we going to do about it? So, uh, you know, how, how do we address the, the rising costs as well, which obviously we're not going to solve right here. But I wanted to go back to the, the question that Rosanita was, was raising about when you actually have lost your housing and you manage to find a spot, somebody takes you in, but it's not a permanent solution because, you know, as she said, couch surfing, but, you know, you're, you're filling somebody else's space and and nobody can do that forever. I've had that experience myself of having people here and after a while you just can't. So you are actually homeless, but you're under a roof. And I understand that it's that it's complicated and the fact that you found a solution seems to keep you from getting help. I wondered if Morgan could could explain that a little less technically <laughs> than what's in the chat. Yeah, and you're you're spot on. Um, and so I'm also going to lean on Amanda because this gets really detailed. And so Amanda, if I misspeak, please do correct me. But the way this works is that there's four categories of homelessness. We prioritize our funds and this our resources in the system for category one, who are people um, who are experiencing literal literal homelessness or sleeping in a place not meant for human habitation. There are other funds that we can serve people that are called prevention programs or what Judge Simpson referred to as eviction um, assistance. Um, it's all considered a prevention. But then prevention also is move-in cost security deposit. And so someone that is category three who is couch surfing for the HUD definition is not considered literally homeless. In the education definition of homelessness, they are considered literally homelessness. Literally homeless. So that's the one disconnect. For RCOC, the continuum of care to provide them resources, they still cannot stay in that unit because then we call it doubled up. What we can do is we can provide um, assistance to get them housed in their own unit. So we can provide them security deposit move-in cost. Um, so we still can't serve them as long as they stay in that household. But if they find another place to stay and they can afford that place, then we can provide them prevention funds, as I pointed out, and then they would fit that eligibility requirement. I see. Okay. Yeah. 
Thanks. Janet, I would just add to that. Morgan is correct. And the the reason that we have to serve um, folks with these distinct categories is the federal regulations and guidelines that speak to the federal funding that is passed on from, you know, the feds HUD to the state to OCD and other organizations that are providing those services. So these are um this, this is really because there are limited resources, and so they are trying to, you know, help those who are most acute, most in need on the streets in shelter, and the trickle effect is that we can't get more upstream to help people who are in Judge Simpson's eviction court, well, we can help them, you know, mostly, but um, who are in those kind of like more... Um, uh, stages of, you know, being able to try to figure it out on their own. We can't get upstream because the federal resources that trickle down to us are very specific on who um, and how we can serve someone. Thanks. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, um, Amanda. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions from the group. Um, and but we did have a question that was uh, brought to us earlier um, that I'd like to ask at this time. Um, so this question would be for all of the panelists and it uh, kind of a quick answer since we have roughly uh, 10 minutes um, left um, in the Q and A. So there are two, it, you know, if we think about uh, the, what the panelists have said, there's immediate needs. Uh, Judge uh, Simpson has talked about the evictions that are happening and the, that those people are literally, some of them uh, becoming literally homeless. Um, and I'll tell you that one of the things that has worried me whenever we've had ice storms or severe cold weather or snowstorms like we just had, I have been literally pit, you know, sick to my stomach worrying that here in Washtenaw County, we would have a situation like happened in Kalamazoo where we, they lost because of the weather, because of homelessness, because of mental health challenges, a mother and two children. They literally died outside because they froze to death. And I was very, very, I've been very sick, like they said, to my stomach. I know families living in their cars and all it would take is a plug tailpipe or running out of gas while, while they were asleep. Um, so there is the immediate crisis. And then as uh, I think it was Andy or maybe everybody mentioned, there is the long-term solutions. There's the long-term crisis. So what um, I'd like to ask of each of you, uh, kind of a short, relatively short answer, uh, starting in the order <laughs> that we went, um, to give us as Democrats three, just two or three things, just a couple of few things. What can we do? about this crisis. I saw Annie in uh, the chat saying, elect other Democrats. We're about electing, uh, you know, elected officials, electing Democrats, elect uh, uh, people to office that care about this issue, that are going to do something about this issue. That's something. But could you all comment on what else as Democrats we can do to help address this crisis and to alleviate the human misery that is out there, especially for our families. So uh, Morgan, do you wanna start? I will start and I'm gonna let my colleagues are probably gonna give you more tangible and specific things. I'm gonna stay um, a little more theoretical and in the anti-racist scope that doesn't provide direct. But um, we often say, Given the data, we're seeing 76% of Black female-led households are now experiencing homelessness at, um, and our families. And we often say all we need to do is house them, which is a good start. 
But many families have generational history of experiencing homelessness, poverty, trauma that make keeping them stably housed hard. It might, it's the easiest part of getting that population housed is actually getting them housed. After that, we have to deal with the mental health, the physical health impacts of what it takes to be honestly and, and frankly Black in America. And if all we think about is as far as we need to do is place them in the brick and mortar unit and not actually attend to all the other traumas, all the other oppressions, and all the other systems that contributed to their overall homelessness, then we will continuously be cycling this. This will never end. So we need to do intentional anti-racist work in all of our systems, including the way we provide the services. I, I don't know how I follow that. Um, <laughs> I'll just say this, I, I think in terms of concrete things that, that can be done, I think we have to be supportive of those that are doing the work. Um, I was a bit taken aback as I'm, I'm hearing the criticisms of Hawk, I'm hearing the criticisms of um, Avalon. I'm going to tell you, I, I get Avalon cases. They are a breath of fresh air. Those are the easy cases for me. <laughs> Um, and that's because the folks at Avalon do one heck of a job of coordinating all the services that the individual needs. And I don't think I had to sign an eviction or maybe one over the past year uh, regarding an Avalon housing um, tenant. And so for those that are questioning whether or not it should be in your community, whether or not it, it, it's going to be there, if it's under the auspices of a place like Avalon, you're going to be in a, you're going to be a lot better off because otherwise you're going to be dealing with them quite frankly on the criminal side of of things so you know i think that needs to be pointed out with the individuals at hawk and what morgan's doing folks understand that they're they're short staffed they're trying to get um, the assistance to people that need to get the assistance they have now a fixed court liaison that is in all of our courts so that those that are truly in trouble, we can get, we can kind of move them up the line so that they can get, so that they can get some assistance and we can take care of them. So I, I think in a lot of ways, a lot of the criticism has to stop, has to stop with those that are really doing the hard work. Um, I'm sort of in a position and all of us judges are in a position where we're the last stop for this when somebody is housed and, and go in. And we realize that there's a lot of work that goes on. So, um, you know, I, I, the initial concrete solutions are that. I will say one other thing that is happening. Um, a lot of the properties, uh, the private um, rental units are being brought, bought by people who are outside of Washtenaw County and that quite frankly, outside of the state. And so in some ways, and I'm not sure how that would happen, that has to change because what we have is we have owners that come in that, I guess I'll just put it this way, don't share Washington County values. Um, and they, they look at the process as one of sort of the cycling of people through these units, which is not what we think of in Washington County. So that's, what I have to contribute. So if anybody has a few million dollars or whatever, I got some places you can buy. <laughs> Aubrey? I'll just say really quickly, I, I think it's important for us to remind ourselves that this is fundamentally a choice. Um, it's a choice that we make at a, at a national level. It's a choice that we make um, interpersonally. Um, you know, uh, there is something profoundly wrong with us when we have uh, accepted the dehumanization of human beings such that we're okay with them sleeping on pavement in the middle of a Michigan winter. And um, I want people to actually treat this with a sense of urgency and, um, and, and as an emergency, because it is that while also willing to embody a multi-pronged long-term anti-racist trauma-centered harm reduction oriented approach that is not about urgency. <laughs> it is a both and. Um, and so I think that um, we can get stuck in really binary thinking and binary approaches. And um, at the end of the day, um, 
a lot of what we are currently grappling with will require us to be uh, harm reductionists in practice because they may it may not be we cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I think it's important to be, have a willingness to um, exercise uh, and practice with multiple strategies as long as they are in alignment with housing first. And I do appreciate the comment, housing first is not housing only, it is housing plus robust trauma-centered, comprehensive person-centered services. And it works and it is very cost-effective. So thank you all so much. I hope all of you walk away today like with like, like this passion and this purpose on this issue, because to be honest, I feel like we're in an echo chamber and often the halls are empty. And so I just want to ask that you show up in more ways than one on this issue. Thank you. Amanda, real quick. And then Andy. Yeah. Ditto what everyone else has said. And, um, we know what works. We don't have the resources to do it. And so we need the resources, the housing, the services, um, to really help folks. We have had people die here on the streets and it is not okay in one of the wealthiest counties in Michigan for that to happen. Andy? Honestly, if if if, if I had the answer that I knew would work, I would share it with you. I, I, I don't. I'll just give you my quick thoughts. Um, many times you'll see folks complaining about uh, tax rates, perhaps in the city of Ann Arbor or other communities in, in Washtenaw County, um, I would just urge you all to try and connect what it is those dollars do to impact and improve the human condition here in our, in our community. Um, you know, budgets are moral documents. And I would urge uh, people like me and my colleagues, uh, folks at the state and federal level, to be bold with those, with those documents. Um, and I would also ask that you uh, continue to push us to be bold with the things that Morgan is talking about in terms of trying to impact the system on the on the on the front end uh, and, and and deal with the racism that, that's built into it. That is not without uh, criticism from some folks. So continue to urge us to be bold, uh, to be proactive. Um, and, and to make our time at the table count for something. So that that that, that would be my uh, my advice. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, I think that a common theme from all of you is housing. There are so many people, particularly families, particularly women and young children, who are homeless in Washtenaw County, who don't have access to permanent housing. And that we all need to come together, all of us who care about this, who do not think people should be sleeping on sidewalks, to get a solution. There are solutions, but those solutions need resources. So again, I and we and um, I I'll ask Morgan, who uh, when she presented to the board of commissioners, somebody asked, "Do you have enough resources and capacity currently?" <laughs> to address the crisis. And I loved your answer. It was a one word, two letter answer. Would you like to give it again? Morgan, do you have, do we have enough? I do want to, the answer time? is no, but Thank I do want to give it again. And yes, it was no. <laughs> Thank you very much, Morgan. And when we talk about solutions, think about Morgan's no. Uh, thank you all. Thank you panelists. And I'm turning this over to Teresa. Wow, uh, we're out of time and that's hard because there are so many people to thank. Kathy, thank you for putting together this incredible program and all of you who have testified and given your wisdom in this last half of the meeting, thank you so much, not just for being here, but for the incredible, incredible work that you do. This will be available, this whole meeting will be available um, on YouTube. So we'll you know, we'll be able to spread it far and wide. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you to our legislators who are just amazing. They're all doing such hard and good work. So thank you for that. Also, I wanna thank people behind the scenes who often don't get seen. Um, Eli Nathans and Loretta Codrington who are co-chairs of the program committee. Thank you for all of your work month after month to get these out. And and two other people, the chair co-chairs of the Communications Committee, 
Tom Knox and Rosanita Ratcliffe. They are heroes and rock stars. They always get the word out. Yesterday when we said, oh my gosh, we can't, we can't meet in person, please spread the word. And they just really sprang into action and got it out everywhere. So thanks Rosanita and Tom. Um, next, next month, April 1st, no joke, we will be in person unless there's a late spring snowstorm or I guess it'd be an early spring snowstorm at the Learning Resource Center. So we hope to see you all there. We'll have goodies, homemade, and um, and just lots of lots of good feelings. So, and Lisa, can, I, can I just ask Kathy to say one word about the subject of the meeting in April? Kathy, would you care to just um, share? Sure. Uh, so, one of the things that uh, has made a difference in saving people's lives in Washtenaw County is community violence intervention. Uh, we've had a task force here in Washtenaw County. Uh, we have groups that the Board of Commissioners has funded doing the work. Um, the state of Michigan is allocate, has allocated funding uh, for community violence intervention work. Yet a lot of people don't understand what it is, what the role is. So we plan on having uh, the meeting talking about that, having some of the folks doing uh, the community violence intervention work uh, some of the organizations and people doing it here to explain what it is um, and talk about, uh, and, and we also have, are asking people from the, we'll have somebody from the Board of Commissioners, somebody from the state uh, talking about why they're supporting it and what's being done on both those levels. But uh, it, it is about saving lives, particularly, and making our community safer. So that's what we'll be talking about next month. And I um, hope everybody will join us then as well. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you, Teresa. No, that's it. We're out. <laughs>